Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks very much, folks, for, for coming to this uh, panel on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Um, my name is Alex Hanafi. I'm an attorney with the Environmental Defense Fund, and I'll be the moderator for this uh, distinguished panel. Um, so I'll just say a few brief words to, to kick us off, and I'll, in I'll introduce the panel and then hand it over to them. Um, so this, is, this panel is about the Paris Agreement and about Article 6. We could talk for a long time about the, uh, the landmark Paris Agreement and its implications. Um, but in this uh, hour that we have together, we're going to focus on uh, one of the key provisions of Article 6 uh, of the Paris Agreement, which is uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Um, which uh, was one of the most uh, delicate and, and contentious issues in the Paris talks. Uh, how contentious? Well, it, was, uh, it almost didn't make it in. It was the, uh, the final piece to be inserted in the Paris Agreement in, in 2015. Um, in the wee hours of the morning, and I think several of, of those on the panel here were there um, in those wee hours. Um, and uh, the other indication, I think, of how contentious and delicate these were is that even though Article 6 is largely about carbon markets, uh, there is no mention of the word markets in the Paris Agreement, or in fact, any mention of the word pricing in the Paris, carbon pricing in the Paris Agreement itself. Um, and that is, gives you some indication of the delicate dance that was being done in Paris, and that still continues in part um, today, and that our panelists will share some insights on for you. Um, now, why are we even talking about Article 6? I think, at least from EDS perspective, part of the promise of carbon markets and international carbon markets uh, as expressed in Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is um, their ability to facilitate the, the use of, of international cooperation, use of, of, of markets to put a price and a limit on carbon pollution um, in order to, to drive up investment in clean energy and sustainable development and drive down pollution. Uh, how much? Well, the, uh, the, some of my colleagues at EDF have been modeling this question of exactly how much more emissions reductions could you get with the efficiency savings that come with um, uh, a global carbon market. And the answer um, is about double. In other words, you can get about double the emissions reductions that are in current national pledges. You can double those emissions reductions at the same cost as is currently embedded in those NDCs, in those nationally determined contributions or client pledges, um, which I think is pretty significant. It doesn't get us to where we need to be to stay below two degrees of, of warming, but it gets us a, a big chunk of the way there. Um, but in order to achieve that promise, that potential promise of carbon markets, they have to be well designed. Um, they have to follow some of the bedrock principles of, of uh, high integrity carbon markets, including the need, for example, to avoid double counting of emissions reductions, counting the same emission reduction twice. Uh, you'd think that would be common sense, right? Um, but it's actually quite contentious in the negotiations and, and continues to be. Um, so, so that's the promise, and it's a, it's a complicated landscape, and we've got a, a great panel to uh, walk us through that landscape um, today. Um, we'll hear uh, an, an overview of the Paris Agreement and kind of where Article 6 fits into that landscape um, with Alden, Alden Meyer from the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, who will kick us off. Um, and then we'll, we'll get a little bit more of a deep dive into Article 6 uh, with Dirk Forrester from uh, International Missions Trading Association. And then uh, finally, Rodolfo Lassi from Semarnat in Mexico will tell us a little bit about um, the Mexican perspective on Article 6 and, and how it fits into d Mexico's domestic uh, climate priorities as well. Um, so just briefly, I'll introduce the panel. You have all their information in your um, app. Uh, you can see all the information on them there, so I'll be very, very brief. They have uh, very distinguished uh, achievements, and I'm not going to be able to read them all, but um, Alden Meyer is the Director of Strategy and Policy at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and he's Director of its Washington office. Uh, he provides general oversight and strategic guidance for UCS's advocacy on global warming, energy, transportation, scientific integrity, agriculture, and just for good measure, arms control as well. Uh, so he's got a wide, wide remit at UCS. Um, Dirk is the president and CEO of the International Missions Trading Association. Uh, before AIDA, he was a managing director uh, at NatSource LLC, uh, managing one of the world's largest carbon funds. And earlier in his career, uh, Dirk was chairman of the White House Climate Change Task Force in the Clinton administration. 
And finally, Rodolfo Lassi is the Undersecretary of Policy and Environmental Planning at Semarnat, uh, which is Mexico's uh, Ministry of, of Environment and Natural Resources. And uh, Rodolfo's career spans over 30 years, in which he has served as a senior public official in, on both federal and local levels. He's also been a consultant uh, and uh, a teacher as well. Uh, so we'll look forward to what he can teach us about uh, Mexico's approach to Article 6. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Alden uh, to give us some insights into the Paris Agreement. Thanks, Alex. And if I can have the slides uh, put up, that would be great. So just to step back, um, what are we pushing for now in Paris? I think everyone's pretty well familiar with the Paris Agreement. It was a historic breakthrough. I've been in this process since before the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Uh, that, of course, was a purely voluntary agreement, uh, and it was clear it was not going to get us where we needed to go <clears throat> in terms of emissions reductions, <clears throat> which, which led to the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 with binding reductions on developed countries only, industrialized countries, and voluntary actions for developed countries. You know the story of Kyoto. Uh, Clinton and Gore negotiated it, but had no strategy to get it through the Senate. Without the U.S. in, uh, it became untenable for other countries to extend it, uh, such as Japan, uh, Russia, and others, leaving at the end only basically the European Union, Switzerland, Norway, and a few others in the agreement, covering about 15 percent of global emissions. So Paris was the culmination of, of really two decades' worth of work about how do you get a agreement that's universal, that covers everyone, um, that has incentives and a, and a process to ramp up ambition over time. And of course the trade-off for that, not only for the U.S., but for some of the major developing countries, is to make the commitments themselves not legally binding. So that's the world that we're in. It's kind of a bottom-up world with some top-down <coughs> features in terms of reporting and, and compliance, which we can talk about if you want to. So where we're at now is to try to show that despite President Trump's announcement that the U.S. will withdraw uh, the day after the 2020 presidential election, ironically enough, is the first day the U.S. can technically withdraw from the agreement. Despite that announcement, we want to show that Paris is irreversible. Other countries are staying in. That, so far, so good. Matter of fact, after Trump announced uh, his intentions to withdraw the U.S., Syria and Nicaragua, which are the only two countries not to have joined Paris, reversed themselves and joined Paris because they didn't want to be associated with Donald Trump. So there you have it. Uh, the second mark, of course, is to signal to the global investment and business community that the transition uh, to a low carbon, eventually zero carbon economy is irreversible. Uh, and of course, that's a little tougher because it depends not only on having the agreement in place, but having it implemented and strengthened over time. And we'll, we can talk about that a little bit too. This year, there's a couple of markers uh, which we'll talk about. One is that there's an agreement that at COP24, the 24th meeting of the Conference of the Parties in Katowice, Poland in December, countries will adopt the implementation guidelines or the Paris rulebook, as we call it, uh, that really give life to Paris and how countries are going to go forward and meet their commitments under Paris. And Article 6 is, is part of the provision of, of, of rules and implementation guidelines that has to be agreed uh, for this to fully take effect. Uh, and then we have to have some momentum towards raising ambition because I think as you're all aware, uh, the assessments are that the current commitments under Paris only get us about one third of the way to the well under two degrees Celsius temperature limitation goal, uh, much less the aiming for 1.5 degrees that develop, developing countries and a number of NGOs fought for and got in the Paris Agreement. So we're we can't celebrate victory. There's a lot more work to be done, and Paris knew that. Uh, we knew that in Paris, and countries build in a process to try to ratchet up ambition over time. We also can't forget about climate impacts, because even if we succeed at meeting the temperature limitation goals in Paris, the impacts of climate change are going to continue to get worse over the next several decades. You're already seeing the impacts with a one degree Celsius temperature increase. Just imagine if you're at twice that level with the thermal lag in the system. So uh, we have to be sensitive to the need to help particularly vulnerable developing countries who through no fault of their own are experiencing these impacts deal with them. Uh, we need much more progress on adaptation and the so-called loss and damage components of the Paris Agreement. Loss and damage is what le what's left over when you've done everything you can on mitigation and adaptation and you're still experiencing both sudden 
impacts like typhoons and hurricanes and slow onset impacts like sea level rise and drought. We, the key there is identifying innovative sources of finance, and that's been a very tough issue because uh, the U.S. and other developed countries don't want to get into that conversation. They don't want to acknowledge that there's a need for much greater flows of finance, not just on clean technology and adaptation assistance, but on loss and damage. So that's going to be a, a struggle, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So what did we get out of COP23 in Bonn uh, last year? This was the first COP hosted by a small island state, and of course they had to have the cooperation of Germany to do it because they couldn't host it in Fiji, didn't have the capability. Uh, we made uneven progress on the Paris rules, and, and we can talk more about this. Uh, Rodolfo and Dirk will, will talk in more detail about Article 6, but of course other rules include mitigation rules on features of naturally determined uh, contributions, on accounting structures, on compliance, on adaptation communications, and on transparency. And this was a longstanding objective of the United States to make sure that countries like China, India, and Brazil had to eventually come up to the same level of robustness and rigor and, and frequency of reporting on how well they're doing on meeting their commitments under these international agreements. And that's, these are all very politically charged issues, and some of them are very technically complex. If you get into accounting for land use emissions, you'll understand how, uh, how complex this can get. Uh, so we made uneven progress in, in Bonn in November. We came out of there with different states of preparation on the text. Uh, the text on the mitigation section, for example, ballooned from 45 pages at the beginning of the two weeks to 180 pages at the end, basically a cut and paste compilation document. Uh, and we didn't get the guidance to allow the co-chairs of the negotiation process to do much work between last November and the next meeting coming up in May. Uh, so they are definitely behind the eight ball in, in terms of uh, being able to meet the deadline of adopting a complete package of rules uh, in Katowice, and I, and I think we'll, we'll probably see uh, some compromises there in terms of the level of, of detail, uh, particularly on some of the more technical issues, and we can, we can talk about that. We did get approval of Fiji's vision for the Talanoa Dialogue, which is a process that was envisioned in Paris to evaluate uh, at COP24 uh, later this year how well collectively the world is doing towards meeting the temperature limitation goals in Paris. We already know the answer to that, but just to put an exclamation point on it, they requested the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to do a special report, the so-called 1.5 degree special report, which will be out in October. Uh, to provide guidance about where we are and how much more we have to do to close the ambition gap to get on track for the temperature limitation goals. Uh, we'll see where this Talanoa dialogue goes. They're going to have a, a full day workshop on it in May at the next negotiating session in Bonn, and then a political high-level discussion of it at the COP24 in Katowice. There was very little movement on finance uh, for adaptation and loss and damage. That frustrated the developing countries no end. Uh, the uh, South Africans on behalf of the Africa Group actually held up the closing plenary for the ad hoc group on the Paris Agreement for three days uh, over a fight about transparency on, uh, on uh, uh, 2020 finance, ramping up to the $100 billion per year commitment that the U.S. and others made in Copenhagen to provide developing countries with finance. And, but on the bright side, there was tremendous visibility for the We Are Still In initiative. The mayors, the governors, the business leaders that went from the U.S. and showed the flag that Donald Trump does not represent all Americans and that despite his announcement of withdrawal from Paris, that we continue to have major sectors of society driving to decarbonize the U.S. economy. And we can talk more about the visibility that that initiative is going to have both at the Global Action Summit back here in San Francisco in September as well as in uh, COP24 in Katowice. So what are the, the building blocks for the Katowice COP24? Uh, Paris Rulebook is, of course, the focus of this session in Article 6 within the rules for implementation of Paris, but there are other ones that we need to talk about. The Talanoa Dialogue, uh, will that actually provide some political momentum and commitment for a process coming out of COP24 at the end of the year for countries to strengthen their commitments under Paris? The deal was that by 2020, uh, countries would either formally inscribe their nationally determined contributions or they would update them, which is code for hopefully strengthen them. Uh, 
Um, but that is a very political process, especially given what Mr. Trump has done with the United States. If you're in China, India, Brazil, how do you justify to your publics that you are going to put more on the table than you did in Paris when the world's largest uh, economy and second largest polluter has said it's not going to comply with what it agreed to in Paris? So we need to have political strategies there with Europe and other developed countries uh, standing in and, and, and building the kind of alliance with China and others that the U.S. did in the run-up to Paris. We also have to get more momentum coming out of there on finance, particularly finance for adaptation and loss and damage, and we can talk about that if you want to in the question period. And then finally, the deal leading up to the Paris Agreement included a component on pre-2020 action, both on mitigation uh, of emissions and on provision of finance and capacity building support to developing countries. And developing countries don't feel the developed countries have kept their end of that bargain that was struck in Durban, uh, South Africa in 2011, to have a pre-2020 track with some robustness to it. And so that became a big issue, and there's going to be sessions at Katowice and actually at COP25 next year, uh, stock taking on, on, uh, on pre-2020 ambition on both finance and action. So just conclude in my piece, uh, the key moments that are coming up between now and the end of the year. Uh, there will be a, a negotiating session in Bonn in May, actually starting April 30th and then the first two weeks of May. Uh, it's pretty clear that there's going to be a second negotiating session, most likely in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, in early September, hopefully just before the California summit so that some of us that want to go to both events can be in one place twice rather than two places at once, which is a little harder. Um, the G7 summit will be in early June in Canada. Uh, the G20 summit will be hosted by Argentina, actually concluding two days before COP24 opens in Katowice. Uh, the significance of those is that those are the two places this year where large groups of leaders from powerful countries gather. Last year, Italy and Germany were the hosts of the G7 and G20, respectively. They were able to power through uh, statements of support for Paris and for climate action despite uh, the United States. Uh, there was a Hamburg Climate and Energy Action Plan adopted by 19 of the G20, uh, which is actually a pretty forward-looking document, so we want to preserve uh, that momentum coming out of these meetings. There's a new anim animal, since we love uh, acronyms in this process. Uh, the Major Economy Forum that was launched by uh, President Obama has now become MOCA, the Ministerial on Climate Action, co-hosted by China, Canada, and the European Union as sort of a stand-in for that process where ministers can come together to informally discuss the state of play in the negotiations as well as to do some offline, real-world uh, kind of initiatives together. And we'll see how those go. There's a meeting in Brussels in May, I believe, and then in October in China uh, just before Katowice. Uh, the Global Climate Action Summit, you know all that you need to know about that if you've been at this conference the last two days, but that will be a key political moment to send a signal to national leaders before Katowice that mayors, governors, business leaders, and others have your back. Uh, the water's fine, come on in. We can raise ambition for fun and profit, as my friend Amory Lovins likes to say, and, and uh, let's go for it. And so leaders raise your game. We'll see if that signal gets transmitted in a way that it's heard in major countries in the two months before Katowice. Hopefully it will be. And then finally, as I said, in, in October, there'll be the release of this uh, IPCC special report that'll underscore from the scientific community how much more remains to be done to fulfill the spirit of Paris. So I'll end it there, sort of setting the table, and turn it over to Dirk and Rodolfo to fill in the details in Article 6. Beautiful. Um, so uh, for those that missed the introductions or haven't seen me before here, I'm Dirk Forrester with IETA. Uh, we follow this Article 6 stuff really closely because um, uh, I think as an organization we take the Paris goals quite seriously of trying to reach for better than two degrees that level of ambition um, and agree with the assessments of Alden and, and uh, um, colleagues that it's, uh, we're, we're a long way from having the level of commitment that's going to be required. So if you look around the planet right now at how different countries are approaching uh, climate change, a number of them are exploring use of uh, cooperative approaches that extend across borders. And um, California is quite familiar with that because it has a linked market with Ontario and with Quebec. 
um, and Mexico's quite familiar with it because it's involved in a number of cooperative discussions that I'm sure um, uh, Minister Lassie will, will brief us on. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion about forms of cooperation in, um, in this part of the world. Uh, but it's not just here. The European Union is, uh, you know, it has its own ETS that has been operational for a number of years. Um, it is a, an ETS that it expects will be a model for others to look at, uh, but it, it is using cross-border transfers every day of uh, mitigation, you know, mitigation outcomes. Um, and now China is exploring what, what it will do on a national basis, starting with the power sector, but also with an eye to possible linkages. And I think there's another discussion today in a, in a follow-on se session uh, looking at exactly what's going on in Asia. So it's happening virtually everywhere that countries are thinking about how they can use these provisions. And um, uh, Alden's right, the co-chairs broadly have not had authority to do much in the intervening time in between sessions, except in the markets area and except in uh, uh, response measures, I think. They got authority to go and develop negotiating text and to put something forward. And believe it or not, in the markets area, they actually did it on time because parties made clear that they wanted to have time to review the text before they get together at the end of this month. So uh, uh, a negotiating text, you can find it on the UN website. It, it reads a little bit more uh, like a menu of ideas of, of how to approach various things. Uh, but much of it focused on um, this question that Alex raised at the beginning about um, building integrity into the system by having uh, fair ways of reporting on um, uh, what they call corresponding adjustments, and we think of as uh, reports on imports and exports of, of units. Um, as part of that, when you read, start reading into the document, there are a number of things in there that are, I, I, at least as we read it, we can see a package that would be nice, simple, easy to work with, and you know, I think would give countries the kind of guidance they are looking for. Um, and, and I think for AIDA, our reading of Article 6 has always been that, in, in a sense, because of the nature of the Paris Agreement being um, kind of a voluntary thing, you put forward your best effort and uh, there's no penalty if you don't meet it, that kind of thing, we've sort of expected the Article 6 guidance to be uh, what we think of as best practice guidance to parties about this is a good uh, standard to work toward. This is an approach that you should, you know, if you're using markets and international transfers, this is how you should go about reporting on them. But when you read the text right now, you'll see a number of things in there that look like the UN would be doing a whole lot more than that. Um, provisions that say that before you could engage in transfers, the, uh, a UN review panel would need to look at your plan and make sure that it meets certain uh, criteria before you would be allowed to use it. I think that's contrary to the spirit of the Paris Agreement and to the spirit of Article 6, so I don't expect that provision to survive but it's there right now. And I don't think it's something that would actually help the cause uh, as much as kind of creating a restriction. There are other things in there that, um, that we like, though, because they do make clear uh, or at least force decisions about how often would we get information uh, at a UN level of what's happened over a particular uh, compliance period. Um, I think for those of us active in, in emissions markets, we're pretty accustomed to looking for the government reports. I mean, here it's the reports from uh, the kit system on how, how many transfers, uh, you know, were, how many units were issued and used on either side of the borders and how much, uh, you know, you kind of get a sense of how much market liquidity there was. Although we also have private sector um, agencies that uh, collect data and provide market data on a much more routine basis, on a daily basis, so that, you know, the par participants in the market know, what, know what's going on. Um, at a UN level, though, when you really think about it, I think what matters over time is having the information on the environmental true-up at the end of what happened over a multi-year period. And, and what happens on an individual day, we don't necessarily care about because we'll be able to get that through, um, through market providers. But you do want these things to, uh, again, to inspire confidence 
um, not only in the user community, but in the policy making community that's helping to set them up. So those, those are some of the ideas that they're wrestling with, and it's all under the guise of this corresponding adjustment language, and, and that goes into, um, any accountants in the room? So it's not accounting like you would know, or for those of you that run businesses, and it's not, it, it, it's, uh, they're trying to kind of borrow some of the terminology, uh, but they haven't really decided on um, what exactly you would adjust. You know, it's a corresponding adjustment, which means that if uh, Mexico and the United States had uh, trading occurring, uh, that if Mexico exports, it would report on that, if the U.S. In imports, it would report on that. That seems pretty simple, right? But while well, they're trying to figure out, are we adjust? What are we adjusting? Are we adju adjusting our commitment, or are we adjusting our inventory, or are we adjusting? One of the ideas there is um, you're just adjusting from a zero basis. Like everybody starts with a zero, and if you if you buy, you report what you bought, and if you sell, you report what you sold, and we just want those numbers crystal clear, and then we'll find a way to include those in the, uh, in, in the annual reports that are, are uh, submitted to the UN. But that's the level of detail that, that this is about, is like, what do you adjust? How often do you adjust it? And what, what are you adjusting for? Is it just CO2 equivalent emissions? Is it all of the various gases that are included in countries' uh, national commitments? Um, is it only the stuff that's inside your target, or is it also, can you trade stuff that's not in your targets? Because the targets are all over the place. Um, so there are a number of sort of detailed things that they need to work toward. But again, uh, I think from my, our vantage point, um, we could probably make a number of those choices work. Like, as, as long as they kind of get a plan and everybody's okay with it and sticks with it and does it uh, in a similar fashion. Um, there are some other things in there, though, that we don't like, um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples just to inspire you to go and, and read up on Article 6. Uh, one is a notion that um, uh, there's a section on limits. Um, we in markets are accustomed to different kinds of limits being put in place, but um, in, in this kind of agreement, uh, you kind of go back to the bare bones of what was put in the article to begin with, and it didn't actually include the idea, some of these ideas. So they kind of were talked about then, and now somebody's kind of sneak, sneak them back in. Um, so uh, examples of limits would be, uh, one is that you could only trade a unit once. That would, and, and, and a sort of a prohibition on secondary market trading. Those two things could be really bad for liquidity, and there could be a real discouragement for countries to go forward. Again, you don't want that in best practice guidance from the UN. Um, uh, th another thing that's there is a, a notion that the UN would get into the business of uh, what we consider market oversight, things that the state of California does uh, at a state level or uh, that it does collectively with its WCI partners in making sure that there's not uh, excessive speculation or market manipulation, those kind of things. Again. Not really a belief that the UNFCCC has a great skill set for you know doing that kind of thing. It's much more appropriate to be done. Uh, you know we support having that in markets, but uh, we've not really experienced the UN trying to do that. So again, we think that's a. a, a, a a thing that would not be helpful. Um, but again, back to the, the basics, just in summary, and I'm happy to talk about other kinds of details um, uh, that, are, that are under discussion there. I may, maybe one that I'll flag that I think is also quite interesting is um, how, how uh, uh, so the Article 6 has a provision. Uh, I've, I've mostly been talking about Article 6.2, which is about these general accounting principles. It also has a section, though, for running a new version of the CDM. Um, it's not called that, but it's called a, uh, um, well, we all just call it the 6.4 mechanism now, but it's a, um, the, the notion of it is it's an offset factory that would be developed at the, uh, you, you call it the SDM, yeah. 
Um, and and uh, I think at AIDA, we've added another letter in there just to make it confusing. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, but th but this the, the notion is that we could learn uh, a lot from what's been done in the past, and that there could be UN infrastructure for countries that want to use it to step forward and um, uh, bring projects forward for approvals. But it's a totally different beast this time around because everybody's got a target. So it means that really first you've got to get an understanding of what the country is doing for its own mitigation. Uh, then you want to get a sense of what it's going to make available for transfer. So um, uh, that, that section of it, I think, uh, and how we think about additionality in that new context is, is going to be quite important. Um, and then finally, related to that, there's also the prospect that a number of countries are interested in of not just limiting themselves to the use of that standard, but also, as California does, recognizing multiple standards, whether that's done under 6.5 or 6.2 is still an open question, but, uh, but I do think it's a, a, uh, an area that um, uh, people are thinking this time around. It's not going to just be a UN monopoly of, a, of an entity that creates these uh, project-based credits, but that they may have a way of also recognizing other standards. But anyhow, so it's a really vibrant time. Uh, so unlike some of the other negotiating streams, when we come together in uh, end of April, um, there's actually a text on the table to wrestle with, with for, for the two-week period, um, and then we'll have a couple more bites at the apple before, before the year is out. Um, uh, the, I think I'm really glad that Alden put up the, the, gave you a sense of what all is happening across the board because um, uh, I think in the markets area, we want rules to be clear earlier so that countries know what the requirements are going to be and they can start developing their plans that, that'll fit with that. Um, but uh, there's a history in the negotiations that um, you can't get agreement on one thing until everything else is agreed as well. So we have to kind of look at what's happening in all of these other negotiating rooms on finance and on response measures and on uh, other, other discussions about technology and about um, what, what transparency, how, how reporting is going to work. Um, and if those aren't all kind of moving in sync, then um, this area could get stalled along with the others. So uh, our hope is that we'll start to see movement in the other areas because for once we actually have gotten our homework done and it seems like it's, it's moving forward. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dirk. And, and yes, Article 6 is in the novel position of actually being further ahead than some of the other negotiations. So it's kind of a reversal from what happened in Paris. Um, but uh, it has some implications for how fast it may go from here. Um, thanks very much. And, and I think your, your, um, your, your discussion around the levels of governance, you know, what happens to the UN versus what happens domestically within countries, that is, I think, a great transition um, to uh, what Rodolfo will talk about, and particularly the perspective from Mexico um, on Article 6. So, Rodolfo, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, in this very moment, we are having an informal experts meeting on Article 6 in Mexico City. Uh, we have more than uh, 60 participants, experts from 27, uh, 27 yes, different countries, no? including all with uh, markets like Canada, Europe, but also we have uh, representatives from Senegal, Tuvalu, New Zealand, Australia, South Korea. So, um, and, and I'm receiving reports right now from, from from that meeting, no, and as you can imagine, we are lost in words and phrases, no? because we invented a new language in Paris uh, during the negotiations in order to avoid the word market and all the words, technical words that we use in the markets. So uh, for us, I mean, for this community, Article 6 is related uh, to markets, but for many countries, it's mostly related with cooperation uh, instruments or uh, programs. No, uh, in, in fact, uh, when we started to call the rule book of the Paris Agreement as a rule book, uh, some countries said, no, no, it, 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 it cannot be a regulation, it must be just a program. So now the rule book that we are, or that we will 
right in in the next uh, six months will be a program, no? And we will have to find a, a different operational mechanisms in order to implement Article 6. So we are talking about three different mechanisms in Article 6 that we must address uh, and uh, in, in a technical way, you know, the negotiators the, uh, are mainly technical people, you know, uh, in order to clarify what is an IDMO. You know? We are not talking about credits or bonds, we are talking about IDMOs. <coughs> you know? uh, international transfer of mitigation outcomes. Those are the credits of the future. You know? uh, uh, the, there will be a subsidiary body in the in the UNF Triple C, but also in, in the COPS, that will uh, oversee the, 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 the procedures of these cooperation uh, mechanisms uh, among us, no, to trade IDMOS. <coughs> so uh, this is one of the cooperation option in Article 6. The other one is the SDM, no, no, no. The, not the CDM, the Mechanisms uh, for Sustainable Development, cooperation mechanisms. And the other one that is under Article 6.8 is the non-market approaches. So with these three different options, we must balance the, the things that will be part of our business and the things that could be part of our international cooperation efforts in order to really uh, achieve the, the Paris Agreement uh, targets. Uh, the the, the co-chairs of APA you know, uh, sent us three weeks ago uh, informal notes about these three different options. And we are discussing the informal notes because uh, we are concerned about the mandate, the scope of our efforts, uh, the approach that we will use to address these options and the, and the, the, the things that are related with operative uh, actions uh, in the different organisms that we are handling. No? But if we talk about IDMOS, that is mainly concern, uh, our, our concern, uh, we, we need to assure in the rules in this program that a ton is a ton no? of CO2. It's, the, the, uh, the basic understanding uh, uh, of a market. Uh, we need to avoid the double counting. We need to keep records. We need to uh, do something that is part of the problem that Dirk was talking about, a um, share of proceeds. This is an, uh, an invention phrase that means fees, no? If we trade, we need to establish a fee. And if the UN receive the fee, where this fee will go? So we'll go to the adaptation fund. That's the proposal from the developing countries. And why to the, in, in the adaptation fund instead of in the GCF or other form uh, to promote more mitigation actions? Well, because it's, it's, that's the, the, the discussion uh, between developing and developed countries. No? Because if we make money trading uh, or giving the developed uh, countries the opportunity to buy pollution in other countries, no? or reductions in other countries, that is the permit to pollute in your country, no? you have to help all the people that is in danger because of the climate change uh, effects, no? the extreme weather events, for example. No? And we need to define uh, also the governance of these uh, procedures, I mean, the, the governance of the markets. Uh, in the future, as we have been talking, we will have regional uh, markets in Asia, in North America, in Latin America, in Europe, and we will trade among those regional markets, and we will trade uh, 
uh, among different uh, countries. And yes, in order to have uh, 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 a real, uh, how can I say it, a record of all these transactions that are that that must be related with the indices with our commitments we need to establish the metrics we need to establish an information system and who will handle that uh, if if the UNFCCC will do it we need to provide them with money no we need to increase the fee that the countries are in, in the UNFCCC in order to, to, to have this system functioning. Or we will use, as the markets today, the stock markets, the infrastructure that we already have. You know? That's, that, those are the main concerns related with Article 6.2 that is talking about ITMOS. If we talk about sustainable development mechanisms, the first question is what to do with the CDM. So uh, we don't like to uh, adopt all the CDM rules, regulations, uh, methodologies. Uh, it's very costly, no? It's a, it's a slow motion elephant, no? So it's, it's not helping a lot, the CDM. So uh, there are countries against CDM, and there are others that say, well, why we don't use the CDM, that is very good effort, uh, uh, to uh, enhance this uh, cooperation and provide the developing countries with uh, more resources, technological or technology transfer, technolo technological help, uh, and, and, and other uh, positive uh, outcomes from the CDM. Who will participate in these mechanisms? Uh, who will be responsible of the goals and targets of this mechanism? And what will be the safe words of the, these sustainable development mechanisms that it, it will be a uh, uh, reshaped CDM? No? That those are the main concerns related with Article 6.1. I will not address the non-market corporation because it's really uh, uh, a very uh, diffuse idea. We, we are having problems in the definition of a non-market, no? because it's mainly this South-South corporation uh, paradigm. And this, this was mainly uh, included because Bolivia was uh, asking for the recognition of the cooperation, for example, that China is doing uh, with many Latin American, African, and Asian Asia uh, countries. Uh, but we are trying to, to really um, harness uh, this, this uh, non-market uh, uh, cooperation uh, uh, option. In summary, I think that uh, in, in bond, in, in May, we will uh, have a little bit more than these informal notes. We will have some drafts of the possible rules uh, of the different options, especially in items. But we will we will try to adopt all the work that AIDA and other organisms that are regulating the, the market or promoting markets as the markets we know. Um, we will try to bring the language, the concepts, and the good practices of those markets that are functioning to the rules. And that, that's our main goal. No? And um, later, perhaps, we will not finish our work in, in Bonn. So uh, we, we are expecting to have another meeting, perhaps, in, in Thailand, in Bangkok and many other expert meetings in order to solve very delicate uh, details of, of the rules. But at the end of, of this very complicated uh, process, we will finally uh, have, I hope so, 
the program, no? uh, what we, we call it the Paris Agreement Work Program. And, and in this program, uh, we, we will have uh, um, an overall view of how this uh, animal will see, uh, how, how will be defined. But later, for sure, we must also develop a, a specific regulations for each component of the new system of trading uh, uh, credits. That's the my, my general. Great. Thank you very much, Rodolfo. Um, so we have some time for, for questions here at the end. We have about uh, a little less than 15 minutes. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go around for questions. I just wanted to actually start with one question for Rodolfo, just to, just to ask him a little bit about um, the, the interplay between the, the domestic work that Mexico is doing on climate and, and what we've been talking about in relation to Article 6 and the international kind of uh, rule book, uh, if, if you want to call it that, for Article 6. Um, can, can you say a little bit about how you see um, Article 6 fitting into Mexico's um, domestic climate agenda, domestic, uh, domestic climate ambition? I, I know Mexico is very involved in these discussions, has been a leader on a number of issues, including at the international negotiations in the Environmental Integrity Group. Um, and domestically, you've been a part of a number of initiatives like the Carbon Pricing Declaration of the Americas, and you're going to be rolling out a, a pilot ETS in, in, in Mexico. Um, can, can you just give us a little bit of insight into how you see Article 6 plugging into or docking into Mexico's domestic climate priorities? Thanks. Well, first, uh, we are trying to introduce the flexibility concept in this uh, rule book. No? Why? Because we are ambitioning to have a North American market uh, among subnational and national authorities. If we put a rule that only parties can trade, no, it will miss our efforts. No? Flexibility not only in the uh, participants in these uh, cooperation schemes, but also in the technical aspects of the, of, of, of the markets, because we are introducing the short-lived climate pollutants in our market, black carbon. No? Of course, there are many discussions, technical discussions, scientific discussions about the metrics uh, of black carbon. But in the future, we must address also the short-lived climate pollutants, especially after the uh, 1.5 report from the IPCC. You will see that the short-lived climate pollutants, like Ramatan said uh, two days ago, uh, are key. Uh, players uh, in order to avoid uh, tipping points on, on, on climate. So uh, flexibility in the rules, flexibility in the participants, flexibility in the technical aspects of the market uh, are relevant. So flexibility is one of the things that we are trying to uh, introduce in the rules. Uh, in, instead of having these uh, rules that Dirk uh, mentioned that will uh, uh, avoid a, a, a more uh, wide uh, market or a world market uh, of, uh, of uh, credits. Uh, the other uh, thing that is important for us is the involvement of other participants that uh, could be players in the future. You know? For example, uh, the or sectors, you no, know, the tourism sector, you no. Know? The tourism is an industry, you no. Know? It's an industry because oh, well, this hotel has a huge boiler. Sometimes the boiler is greater than the boiler in the factory, you no. Know? But also uh, with the boiler, uh, uh, with the, the hotel, you you have a transportation means, and you have many other. Uh, activities related with the tourism sector that are emitting greenhouse gases. But uh, we will have, as I mentioned two days ago, uh, subnational markets, national markets, regional markets, and sectorial markets. So in the sectorial 
dimension, uh, we don't know what will happen in the future. So we need a progressive rule book according with the new players and new stakeholders in these cooperation schemes. So that, that, that's important, uh, uh, especially if we talk about uh, uh, countries like uh, Tuvalu or Fiji <laughs> or uh, countries that with, with sectors that can contribute later uh, as a high emitters as soon as we have uh, low carbon uh, economies. Thank you very, thank you very much, Rodolfo. And and I think your your uh, mention of, of the tourism sector and of sectoral uh, approaches is, is very relevant to the next one of the next panels. It's going to be talking about the, the, the first sectoral emissions limit uh, on and under the international aviation, which I think is in one of the rooms near here. So if folks are interested in sectoral approaches. The next panel will be will be talking about that. So we have a little bit uh, a little bit around ten minutes left. Let's open the floor for questions. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand and. Holly will come and, and find you and give you a mic uh, to let us all hear you. Questions? Or if you have an answer, that's fine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we need answers, yes. <laughs> if you have some of those, let us know. Okay, yeah, in the front. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get asked a lot by friends is uh, how much are the, um, I guess basically the, the rich countries helping out uh, the poor countries and I caught in, came in the sort of the middle of your comments. So, on a scale of one to ten, how are we doing with that? <laughs> well, maybe just say a little bit about it and then get others' perspectives. I mean, I, I did mention the the Copenhagen pledge of one hundred billion dollars per year mobilized in public and private funds by the developed countries for developing countries. That's for both clean technology mitigation projects as well as adaptation projects. Um, but I think, um, you know, the jury's out on whether that target's going to be met. It obviously has been made harder by the decision of President Trump to withdraw the U.S. from fulfilling the remaining $2 billion of its Green Climate Fund pledge uh, that President Obama made and to try to cut more dramatically into overall U.S. funding. So the question is which developed countries are going to make up some of that gap created by the U.S. because it doesn't seem like that's going to change between now and 2020. Uh, the other question, of course, is, is how much of that $100 billion can be met by private sector mobilization triggered by public sector investments and how much can be met by international development banks like the World Bank and others. This is a very contentious issue with developing countries about the meaning of that $100 billion pledge and what it's going to take to meet it. And, of course, every analysis shows that $100 billion is much smaller than is needed to meet collectively the needs of developing countries for uh, investment in clean technology as well as investment in adaptation activities. It's, it's order of magnitude higher than that. So, you know, the climate finance is a charged area. There's a lot happening in it. It's very political uh, and it's very complex. Any, no? Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Actually, I want to build on that question, Nancy Young, Airlines for America. So it's a, it's a really fascinating question when you get to the ITMOs and the export issue. And it comes back to what Dirk was saying earlier about how, what do you do in terms of corresponding adjustments? So we'll talk about this maybe more on the panel after this, but one of the things that we're seeing as, as airlines trying to get our system up and going is some countries saying, we're not really sure that we're going to allow our offset projects to be eligible to participate in your system, in part because we might have to keep those for our own NDCs. And then this gets to this question, we're a source or a potential source of climate finance, like a lot of folks who would buy offsets would be. And so where do you, how do you see that tension working out? Because we thought this is like this great thing that we can bring good money into some of those projects, and then some countries are like, well, we're not, we're not so sure we want your money. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and give a view. I mean, I think that's part of why um, we're trying to keep the pressure on people like Rodolfo to get this work done this year so that then we can turn to that question about what are countries 
plans for what are they going to include in their own because they need to elaborate that and I do think you're right I've heard this um, you know one of the real interesting examples out there right now around planning for use of article 6 is what Japan's been doing in the joint crediting mechanism so it Japan has a program with uh, it, it basically MOUs in place with around 18 different countries where it's been sitting down for a couple of years and identifying project types that they could work on collectively. But I, I hear through the grapevine that that same question is coming back about, well, let's put the brakes on a little bit before we decide how, we, how would we share these benefits because we need to develop our national game plan first. Um, so they need to know what the rules are, both sides, whether you're a transferor or a, a rec receiver, you'd kind of need to know uh, this time, that's, that's the big difference to me this time of what's going to happen on the ground. Um, I think in, in AIDA, uh, and you'll know this, Nancy, from talking to some of our members, um, the, co the companies that are involved in voluntary markets are facing this now where you'll have a project that might have a 10-year stream. If you're entering that project right now, you might, well, you're going to have about three years of vintages, and then you're going to have seven more where you don't know yet what the country's plan is. Are they going to uh, give you the sign-off for those to be transferred or not? So um, our affiliate, ICROA, has done some thinking on this of trying to offer guidance to practitioners in voluntary markets about so, some options for how to deal with that. It's a big, a big issue, though, big issue. And Takashi Hongo, Mitsui Institute. Uh, my question is a uh, voluntary standard. So the, uh, as Derek said, the voluntary market is there. But the voluntary standard, what is the voluntary standard under uh, the uh, Article 6? So articles, uh, one of the possibility be a uh, uh, voluntary standard would be an uh, eligible standard under Article 6.2. But I'm not sure. What do you think about that? Uh, Role of the voluntary standard under the Article Six. So um, I'll, I'll I'll give a take on this as well, and in full disclosure, so Aida is a very big family, including um, Mits, uh, Mits, Mitsui uh, is one of our members. So this is one of my board members asking me a question. <laughs> so I hope I get it right. But, but as part of our big family, we also have five different standards organizations, including CAR and uh, VERA and um, ACR. Uh, there's a Canadian version of that, um, the Canadian Standards Association, that's one of our members, and a Middle Eastern version of it called GORD in um, Qatar. So there are a number of standards that are, part, that, that are lo looking at this um, and whether they could provide a competing alternative to the, um, uh, the 6.4 mechanism. Um, and I guess as I look at it, there's, well, there's a couple of options, right? You could try to get your program approved as a 6.4 um, affiliate, which is kind of what I think the, the approach that the aviation sector is looking at, sort of approving entire standards. Or it could come in under 6.2 where a country decides what standards it wants to accept. And uh, in, the, in the world of the future, uh, uh, the buyers and sellers would have to be happy with those types of standards that are being used. That's, I think, why we envision these clubs forming, right, is that you could see a set of North Americans that like certain standards and maybe some Middle Eastern countries that like that standard. Um, and for many, I think particularly in Africa, I think the use of the UN standard is going to be much easier to lean into. Um, so I think it could actually appear either place. Um, my general sense is that it probably belongs more in the 6-2 world, um, just because that's, to me, the, the place where countries are um, deciding what they want to do as opposed to having the UN. I wouldn't want the UN to have to approve every ton coming out of those other standards or something that could get really uh, complex and cumbersome. So anyway, it's an issue that people are talking about. OK. Uh, I think we're right at the end of, of time for the panel. So I want to thank you all for, for being here. And, and please join me in thanking the panel for uh, sharing their insights today. Thanks. Thanks.